Well, the story of Ruth, we are coming uh, to the real crux of the matter, uh, not quite at the conclusion yet, and we're going to look at the character of Boaz today and see what we can learn. The story of Ruth is all about names, and hopefully you're getting that. And if you forget everything else, try and remember some of the names that are involved in the story of Ruth, because once you know the names and the meaning of the names, you can trace the plot, you can see how the story unfolds, and it's fascinating that way. It's not just about personal names. It's about a name like having a good reputation. It's also about honor and dignity and having integrity in society. So when you say someone has a good name as a worker or as a father, I'm talking about their reputation. That's part of what's going on here. It's also about having an enduring name, a name that lasts. That's a big uh, concern for Naomi because Elimelech is dead and Elimelech's name will be no longer. His line will be cut off. Now, we found out in our footnotes class why that's so important. I'm not going to share it here because they dug... No, it's... If you trace the line of the promise of the seed from Genesis all the way through, we find that that line includes Elimelech. So now, the promise of the Messiah, of the seed that would come is in jeopardy because Elimelech is dead. That's part of the story. That's part of the crux of the issue that's coming about here. And so it's about the preservation of that name so that you and I could be here today. And that's what we find out as well. But it is also about the meanings of the literal names that people have because when we use people's names, what do we do? We honor them, we recognize them, we acknowledge them, we dignify them. One of the greatest things we can do for some of our youth, for some of our children, is learn their names. Because when we say their names, when we don't just say, hey kid, or hey you, you know, that's why we put the name tags on some kids on their back. So that when they're running away from us, we can actually use their proper name to call them back. Right? But names are important, and we get that. And when we use our names, we, we recognize one another, we honor one another. And so we have names that have meaning in the book and story of Ruth. Elimelech, it means my God is king. Unfortunately, Elimelech did not live up to his name. Instead, Elimelech is a living example of what it means when there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end leads to death. That's the Limelech story. That's what he reminds us of. Well, we also learn about Naomi. Naomi, whose name means, does anybody remember? Pleasant. And she changed her name to Mara, which means bitter, right? And that's part of her story. And it reminds us that suffering is part of our life. Suffering is part of our life. But God is still plotting for our joy. God is still working toward our greater good. We learned about Ruth, and Ruth's name means friend or companion. And Ruth reminds us that God's covenant kindness is always with us. So even when Naomi couldn't see the kindness of God, Ruth was there to remind her that God's kindness is always present. So today we look at Boaz, and Boaz, his name means strength, or more accurately perhaps, strength is in him. It's a great name to have. Picture Boaz as being some great big guy, kind of like the rock or something like that. But he wasn't, and we'll find that out in just a minute. Boaz is actually, and this is important for us, he's the responding character in the story. He's not the initiating character. This is really interesting, especially in a time and a frame and a culture in which the patriarchy was dominant and dominant in such a way that it was detrimental to women. Very much so, and we discovered that in footnotes as well as we read some very dark passages in the time of the judges and how women and daughters were treated as pieces of property, right? Boaz is not the initiating character in the story. He is the responding character. Naomi and Ruth are the initiating characters. It's Naomi and Ruth's decisions. It's their actions that move the storyline forward. And Boaz actually responds to their initiative. Put it this way. If Ruth and Boaz were dancing, Ruth would be the lead. 
That's what we're finding in this story, and it's quite fascinating. Anything that Boaz does, he does in response to the request of Naomi or Ruth. And the interesting thing about this is Boaz's manliness, <laughs> his importance is not diminished by being in this kind of relationship with the woman in his life. Car Carolyn Cur Custis James says this, Boaz is not diminished, marginalized, or feminized in the slightest by being outnumbered and influenced by Ruth and Naomi. As a matter of fact, he only grows stronger himself through his collaborations with them. That's an important aspect of what's going on here because it elevates the status of men and women back to being created equally in the image of God. And the idea, just as Adam and Eve were created equally in the image of God and were meant to work together collaboratively for God's purposes, so now we see a redemption of that initial image in both Ruth and Boaz as they work together. So what makes Boaz so special? Why is he a, the kind of man that we all would like to be? <laughs> Well, there's three things, of course, that I'm going to share with you. There's lots more. But here's three things about Boaz that I think we need to pay attention to. First of all, he was a man of faith. And we learn this right when we first hear his voice in the story. The first time we hear him really speak is when he greets his workers in the field. And he says, the Lord be with you. And they respond, the Lord is also with you. This is unique, and maybe we don't think it's unique because, well, it's in the Bible. Of course, they're all people of faith. Not so in the time of Judges. Read the final three chapters of Judges, and you'll realize just how twisted and dark and sordid the time was. They were not following the way of God. There were not many people that were naming God's name in such a way as Boaz did. So we know right from the get-go that he's a man of faith. And this faith wasn't just a personal, private experience. This is the kind of faith that he took to the workplace. He cultivated faith wherever he went. He was a man of faith in his place of work. Remember when I was still framing houses, I worked with a man, Rick Friesen is his name. Yes, he was Mennonite. I worked with a lot of Mennonites, and Rick Friesen was one of them. And uh, Rick, at the beginning of every day, we'd drive there early, and before we even set up, he would gather his crew all together, and he would just he'd give us instructions, and then he would pray for us. And there was always people in the crew that were not followers of Jesus. They were not people of faith. He always maintained a place in his crew for someone that needed work. Could be someone right off the street. All they had to do is show up and he'd find a job for them to do. Rick was a man of faith. And his faith mattered so much that he brought it to work. Boaz is like that. He's a man of faith. Not just in his greeting, but in his actions. He honors the law of God. He reserves parts of his field for those who are in need. He doesn't harvest to the edges or the corners. He's a man of faith. He recognizes the stranger and the foreigner and the widow, and he works for their justice. That's what a man of faith does. So first of all, Boaz is a man of faith. Second, and I also like this about Boaz, he's a man of wealth. We should all emulate this. This is good. No, he's a man of wealth, and this is super important in the story. Now, we shouldn't think of Boaz as some, you know, six foot two, tall, dark and handsome, strapping man. We have to understand this, that Boaz is an older, wealthy farmer dude. And we see that in verse 10 in the uh, scripture that was read for us. He's not a young man. In fact, he comments to Ruth, uh, you're so kind to me because you could have gone chasing after a lot younger men and there's some out there that have some money, but you have shown your kindness to me, which seems to indicate that Boaz was maybe a little bit older. He was older, but he was also a man of means. He had some wealth about him. I would suggest that Boaz probably even had another wife already because he wasn't particularly concerned about continuing his line or his inheritance when he ends up taking over Ruth's line and, and, and uh, Naomi's line and inheritance. And so Boaz is also a man of wealth. Strength is in him, and he has the strength 
to redeem Naomi and Ruth. And he uses his ability to generate wealth in order to bless the people around him. I want to say this. Elimelech was also a man of wealth. That's what we're to understand. He had fields. He had means. But when the famine hit, he ran for the hills. He ran for Moab. It doesn't seem to me that Boaz ran. Some Jewish uh, scholars would suggest, some rabbis would suggest, that Elimelech ran, not because he was afraid of going hungry, but because he didn't want to fulfill his obligations to help the poor. But Boaz didn't run. Boaz stayed where he was and in fact used his position, used his wealth, used his affluence in order to take care of the people around him. And that's very, very evident in this story. So he's a man of faith, he's a man of wealth, and thirdly, and maybe most importantly, he's a man of integrity. Do you see what happens in the story? This is a bit of a, a scandalous part of the story, isn't it? We hinted at this last week. It's when Naomi says, you know, Ruth, I got to take care of you. And we learned in footnotes, some people suggested that maybe Naomi was saying, I got to take care of me too, <laughs> right? So Ruth, I got an idea. I'm too old for this, but you... You're young. Put off your you know, old clothes. Take a bath. Put on something nice. Wear some perfume. Go lie at his feet when he's had a little too much to drink. And let's see what happens. <laughs> what is going on here? And I don't know if that was on Naomi's mind, that maybe there's a bit of entrapment. Maybe, I mean, he couldn't resist. And if something happens there, then we've got him. And he's obligated to fulfill his duty now because you have his son or his child at least, right? I don't know if Naomi had that in mind. There's, there's a history of people in Moab. That's how Moab started. Maybe that's part of the background to all of this. The Moab started when Lot's daughters went in thinking that their line was going to disappear. They took matters into their own hand. They got their father drunk, slept with him in order to continue their line. Maybe Naomi's saying, hey, it worked for them. Maybe it should work for us. But what happens? What happens when Ruth, all perfumed up, all dolled up, all in her finest clothes, goes and lies at his feet? What happens? Nothing. Honestly, as we look through the story, there's nothing in the story to suggest that he took advantage of her. All along the way, Boaz has been for Ruth's protection. He's been watching out for her. Do you remember when she came and said, let me glean actually among uh, your servant girls, not among the gleaners at the back because that's unsafe. And he said, absolutely. Because when, when the grain is tall and some of the unscrupulous men, they would take advantage of the gleaners. It was not safe. And so Ruth is always being protected by Boaz. Do you notice what he called her in the passage when he sees her at his feet? And first of all, he goes, whoa, there's a woman at my feet. <laughs> that would be a surprise, right? And she says, I'm your servant, Ruth. And she doesn't offer herself to him in any kind of way. She actually challenges him, says, you know, Boaz, you've got a duty. You are our nearest redeemer. In her mind, that's what she thought. And what is his response? He calls her my daughter. Twice. There's this, this sense of protection, sense of, of compassion that's very much part of Boaz's integrity, and he honors her request. And he doesn't say right away, yeah, let's do this. He says, you know what? I want to do this, and I'll do this for you, but I need to do it that is, you know, within the law. And so he says, there's someone else. There's someone else in line ahead of me. I'm going to check with him, but I'm going to do it right away. This is a man of integrity who follows the law to do what is right, but also understands the spirit of the law to do what is just. That's what Boaz does. And so Boaz stands out against the culture of his time. He goes against the flow of culture. And the flow of culture, it says that in the time of the judges, everybody was doing what was right in their own eyes. We could say that Boaz was outstanding in his own field. I had to throw that in there. He's a farmer. Come on. Okay. I say that to lighten the, the load a little bit because as we look at Judges 19, 
we see the contrast. And I think we're meant to do this. Um, if you go home today and if you're brave enough, read Judges 19 and then read chapter 3 of Ruth and you will see the contrast between Boaz and a man of integrity and what all the other men seem to be doing. Judges chapter 19, uh, and I'll just give you the Coles notes, the PG-13 version, because it is dark and disturbing. It tells the story of a Levite who decides to take a concubine for himself. Now, a Levite, that's where the priest came from. He should have known the law. He should have known all of what God had instructed. But he takes a concubine. And for whatever reason, this concubine decides to leave him and go back to her father's house, probably for good reason. Did I tell you this was an awful story, even as I think about it? He decides to go reclaim his property because that's how it was perceived. His concubine, his wife's daughter's property. And as he goes there and he eventually retrieves her and he's making his journey back to his home, they run out of gas. They literally, they end up going way too late at night into this town where they shouldn't be. And they're waiting in the town square for someone to offer them hospitality. They're in a dangerous, vulnerable position. Finally, someone says, come to my house for the night. All seems well. The verse in Judges 19 even says, while they were having a good time together, <laughs> some of the men from the town, they come and start banging on the door. Send out this man to us. We want to rape him. And these men, they desire to gang rape this, this guest. It's, it's uh, reminiscent of Sodom. And the same thing that happened there. So you know what the solution was? You know what this brilliant Levite comes up with along with his host? Here's my daughter and my concubine. Have them. Have them. Have some of my property. We, we, can't, we can't damage this man, but you can have at it because these women are just property. And so they send out the concubine in the end. Literally, it says in the, in the passage, he pushes her out the door. And the men have their way all night long. And this poor woman in the morning stumbles to the door of the house. And when the Levite comes out, what does he say? Get up. Let's go. But she's dead. You know what he does? He throws her body on a horse, takes it home, cuts it up, and sends it all over Israel. And it starts a civil war. Okay, I told you it was a horrible story. I mean, it should make us grieve inside as we feel that, right? And I think it's intentional because when we see Boaz's character against that, we realize that, that Boaz is, is literally an outstanding man of integrity. And we see that. Why was Boaz so different? How did he have the strength to stand against the culture of his time? How did he have the strength to be different when everybody else was saying, this is the way you do it. You're a man, take full advantage. <laughs> a gorgeous woman, perhaps, smelling really nice, is at your feet. Take advantage. And Boaz says, no, I will do what is right by her. How does he have this kind of capacity? Well, I think here's part of the story. That's very interesting. Several decades before Boaz and Ruth meet, there's a man by the name of Joshua. Anybody heard of Joshua? As they enter into the land, um, uh, Joshua was sent, or the two Israelite spies sent across the border into Canaan. And the spies are sent into Canaan to get a lay of the land, right? And the idea is that they're going to to find out who's there so that when uh, the, the Hebrew people go in, that they know what they're going to face. Well, these spies find lodging with a Canaanite woman whose name was Rahab. And Rahab, she was selling herself as a prostitute to support her family, right? So she appeals to them in the name of Yahweh, please save my family because of the kindness I've shown to you. Please remember that when the people come in. And so these spies, they were honorable men as well. And so they honored that request and they saved Rahab and her family. And the Bible says that Rahab remained within the company and the land of Israel. She eventually marries a noble person and gives birth to a son. And Matthew says that son is Boaz. Boaz. 
In other words, Boaz already knew the grace of God in bringing in a stranger, an enemy, a foreign woman, a woman that would have been uh, disregarded by others within to the fold of Israel. Boaz already had that example. He knew the value of that. And whether it was the direct next line, like it was Rahab and then Boaz, or where, where there might have been a little bit of, of uh, a few other people along the line, Boaz is still a son of Rahab, and that's part of the story. And so he offers that to Ruth as well. Boaz saw God's grace in action. He knows what redemption looks like. And so he jumps at the opportunity to be part of the redemption of Ruth and Naomi. And in doing so, he becomes part of our redemption as well. You see, we are like Ruth. We are called strangers. The New Testament says that we're foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Like Ruth, we are seen as enemies of God. That may sound strange to you, but it says in Romans that we were God's enemies, and while we're God's enemies, God loved us. We are the poor, just like Ruth. And in Ephesians 1, it says that we're redeemed according to the riches of God's grace. We are the ones who have no inheritance. We have no future. And yet in Ephesians 1, it says that the Spirit is given to us as a deposit, guaranteeing us the inheritance that we now have in Christ, that we have a future in Jesus. We are the vulnerable. But Romans 5 says, while we are still powerless, Christ died for us. We are Ruth, and Boaz is Jesus, our Redeemer, who has brought us into the fold. The first movie that um, Christine and I saw, 30 years ago now, the first movie that we saw together in a theater was in White Rock, and we went to the theater together. Um, I walked there, and I walked back. Christine drove past me, honked the horn, and waved, which was kind. I bug her about that to this day, and she's like, well, you were only two blocks from the theater, but anyway. <laughs> she was driving a 12-passenger van. There was room. <laughs> we, we could even, you know, separate to leave room for Jesus. That was no problem in that van. Anyway, I, so the first movie, back to the story. The first movie that we saw starred Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise. Any guesses? What's the famous line in the movie? You can't handle the truth. Uh, Christine says to, to me all the time now. What's the movie called? A Few Good Men, right? It's an interesting story. Uh, we watched it recently with, with Kira, actually, in Palm Springs. Um, and it was kind of funny to watch, you know, a 30-year-old movie. But the, the heart of the story and the, the title of the story actually comes from the recruiting slogan of the Marines, the recruiting slogan of the Marines, and the Marines are apparently like the smallest of the, the military um, uh, companies in the United States. They're still huge. But the slogan is this, we're just looking for a few good men, right? Boaz was a good man among the few. He was a rare example of, of integrity. He was a man of character. He was a man whose ego was not threatened by the initiative and leadership of women. He was a man whose faith was lived out in acts of justice. This is the kind of man that we're seeing in Boaz. But he's also a man who points us to Jesus. And that's his ultimate gift to us, is that Boaz leads us to Christ and points us in the direction of Jesus. And it reminds us, he reminds us, that though we, men and women, are in this world, we are not meant to be of this world. That's part of the message that comes to us from Boaz. So God is still looking for a few good men and women, people will, that will live out his redemptive truth in the world, just like Boaz did. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your servant, Boaz. We thank you that his character was one of integrity, that he knew your truth, and he lived in accordance with your law, and he acted in ways of justice and mercy with his neighbor. Father, on this one hand, we ask that you'd help us to be like Boaz, to stand up against the culture of our world that is anti-God at times, and to still hold to the truth of your gospel, still act in ways of justice in the world. 
But Father, we thank you for Boaz's greatest gift, which was pointing us to your son. We thank you that even though we are the strangers, we are the powerless, we are the ones in desperate need, we thank you that you sent Jesus with integrity to redeem us. And we give you thanks in his great name. Amen.